Well, good morning and welcome to Kennewick First United Methodist Church. So glad that you're able to join us this Sunday morning as we share together in this time of worship and celebration, at least in this virtual way. So I hope that you are ready to uh, participate in this service wherever you are this morning, whether it be uh, in front of a television screen or maybe in front of your computer screen or around a kitchen table. Uh, I'm just so glad that you are able to join us as we gather together in this virtual way to celebrate and worship the God who loves us. So welcome to Kennewick United Methodist Church. Welcome to church, my friends. Good morning, everyone. We are glad you could join us for worship this morning. We've got some good songs to sing. I hope that you will enjoy them and sing along with us. Our first song this morning is one that just rings true to me again, um, that it is so sweet to trust in Jesus and to be able to rely on his promises and to know that he is trustworthy. So let's sing together. This is the time in the service when I would normally invite us to stand up from the seats that we're in and and walk around the sanctuary and greet one another, wish each other good morning and pass the peace of Christ. You know, one of the most important things about being part of a church community is that we look out for one another and that we care for one another. And so what I want to do this morning is just challenge you to to think of two people that you could send a text message to or an email to, maybe even pause this video and have a, a brief phone call with them, just to check in and just to let them know that you're thinking about them as a way of passing this peace of Christ to one another. So friends, take just a moment to, to reach out to somebody, wish them good morning, and pass the peace of Christ to one another. Let me offer this opening prayer as we continue to worship uh, in this time together. Friends, would you pray with me? 
Lord, as we gather here in this place, Lord, we pray that your spirit would be the thing that occupies the space between us. Lord, we pray that your spirit would bind us together. And Lord, as we continue to grow in our understanding of what it is to be your disciple, what it is to be your church, we pray that you would lead us to those places where we find hope and where we find joy. Lord, as always, we give ourselves to you, and Lord, we pray that you will meet us exactly where we are. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to express my appreciation to all of you who have been supporting Kennewick First United Methodist Church throughout this whole pandemic and all the the things that we've been going through together. Uh, Because of your financial support, we've been able to uh, continue to do the ministries that God uh, is calling us to do and to be about. And so thank you so much for your generosity and uh, helping us fulfill that mission that we're called to. I just want to remind you also that, that if you would like to help donate to our special VBS project that we'll be doing uh, in conjunction with our book bags and school supplies at the end of the summer, um, if you uh, go to our webpage and make a donation through uh, either our webpage or if you text Kennewick First to 77977, uh, when you uh, get to those uh, those pages, there'll be a drop-down menu, and if you'll just uh, pull down that drop-down menu and make your donation in uh, the other fund uh, that's listed there as other, uh, and then just on the memo uh, listed as VBS project, we'll make sure that those funds go to help us um, uh, provide that kind of modified VBS that we'll be doing with kids this summer. So thank you so much for your generosity uh, and uh, helping us uh, maintain and uh, continue to be the church that God's called us to be. Thanks, my friends. fancy uh, recording studio in my house and everybody sounds good in the shower right so I'm going to sit on the edge of my bathtub and uh, play a song for it. Struck down but not destroyed. 
I am blessed beyond the curse, for His promise will endure, and His joy is going to be my strength. Though the sorrows may last for the night, His joy comes in the morning. Cause I'm trained by sorrow. I'm trained by pain. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I'm trained by sickness. I'm trained by shame. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. Friends, would you join me in a liturgy of prayer as we give thanks to God for the gifts that he's given to us and we ask for God's help in times of need and in times of trouble. Friends, would you join me in prayer? For the gifts of friendship, family, and communities of love. give you thanks. We pray for those who feel lonely, isolated, and afraid. Lord, hear our prayer. For first responders and medical personnel in harm's way to keep us safe. Lord, hear our prayer. For those dealing with health issues, illness, and disease. Lord, hear our prayer. For our local government officials in the Tri-Cities. Lord, hear our prayer. For our elected officials and leaders of our state. Lord, hear our prayer. For the leaders of our nation and other world leaders. Lord, hear our prayer. We ask all of these things, Lord, as we pray that prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law but under grace. 
What then? Should we sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members of slaves to impurity and to greater and greater inequity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from the things of which you now are ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Good morning, my name is Mary Ann Dorr, and I'm going to be sharing um, scripture with you this morning. The scripture is Genesis 22, 1-14. through 14. For me, one of the hardest and most amazing at the same time scriptures in the Old Testament. Um, so we're going to read a little bit about Abraham. Some time later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, Abraham replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son, and the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, The Lord Will Provide. And to this day it is said, On the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Well, again, good morning, friends. Uh, I'm so glad that you're able to join us as we gather together to worship and celebrate this God who loves us um, in this virtual way. You know, a number of years ago, I uh, made a commitment that um, I wouldn't pass on difficult passages of Scripture or <clears throat> wouldn't um, move on to another uh, topic when those passages either came up in lectionaries or, or for whatever reason that they came up um, as topics for sermons. Uh, I, I made this commitment years ago when I was uh, serving uh, another church, and there was a controversy. Um, what, I don't even remember what the controversy was at the time. One of the controversies that the church has had to deal with in the last 25 years. And as I was trying to help the congregation, first of all, kind of understand what Scripture had to say about this topic, and, and also help them understand who they were in terms of their ideas around that controversy, um, I found that... Um, in reality, for the most part, the congregation I served had 
not studied those scriptures, let alone even read those scriptures. And so I made a, a commitment at that time that when we came to difficult passages of scripture, um, although my first inkling is to move on to a different one and maybe not tackle them uh, in a place, because quite frankly, it's just a whole lot easier. But I made a commitment that we would uh, actually have conversations and talk about some of those, those passages. Um, we may not always come to a consensus. We may not even come to a satisfying agreement around what Scripture is telling us or how we understand ourselves in light of those Scriptures. But I wanted to be faithful in at least um, as a, a spiritual leader for the congregations I serve to at least put us in a place where we can uh, at least have the conversation uh, and be familiar with the passages that revolve around some of those um, difficult passages. So having said that, there have been times when I've been very glad that I made that commitment. And although it, it makes my life a little bit more difficult as a preacher, um, it, uh, I think in the long run, is a good thing for, for all of us uh, in churches to be able to, to have those conversations around difficult passages. There have been other times uh, when I have uh, come to these difficult passages and I think to myself, Mark, what were you thinking to make that kind of a commitment? And, and how stupid were you to even tell people that you made that commitment? Because now you've got to do it because you told people that you'd do it. So there, there's times when it's more difficult than others. And this morning is one of those passages of Scripture that, quite frankly, I, I'd rather just punt on. I just assume that it's fourth and long, and we'll punt the ball away, and we'll come back and tackle it another time. But I made this commitment to uh, talk to you about these passages of Scripture. This passage of Scripture that we heard read for us from Genesis chapter 22 is, is literally my least favorite passage of Scripture. And I, I don't mean that like in a joking way. I mean, it is one of the passages of Scripture that I earnestly wish wasn't in the Bible. Uh, it is one of the most difficult ones for me, and I've wrestled with it for years. Um, it is a, a passage of Scripture that by far is my least favorite. In fact, I can't even think of what is a close second to this passage of Scripture. It involves God testing Abraham and uh, telling Abraham to, to sacrifice, to kill his own son as an act of devotion. And boy, it is, it is a, a horrifying passage to, to, um, to read about, and um, it's a story that I wish wasn't there, and I have wrestled with it for years. Uh, you know, I do this for a living. I have a, a degree uh, in uh, theology and taken graduate level courses on, on Bible study and hermeneutics and exegetical Bible studies, and have gone through all those things, and I tell you, I still wrestle with this passage of Scripture, and it has taken me um, a long time and I fully admit a lot of gymnastics and maneuvering to try to, to come to a place where I can at least hear some truth in this passage of Scripture and put aside uh, all the feelings that it generates uh, around violence and around this idea of a son sacrificing, or a, a father sacrificing his son as a, a means of endearment, right? And so this is one of those passages of Scripture that is hard for me. I, I fully admit that I don't have answers that are uh, entirely satisfying around this passage of Scripture. Uh, I don't know that I'll ever have a, a place where I come to an understanding of this Scripture that gives me a sense of lightness or a sense of saying, oh, I, I get it, and fully understanding what this passage is about. Um, and so uh, as I talk about it today with you, I'm going to give you some of the things that I've grown to understand about this passage of Scripture, um, but fully understanding that they're not totally satisfying for me, and I understand that they may not be totally satisfying for you either. Um, I will also add that it's taken me a long time to get to a place where I'm okay with that. Uh, I understand that there are some things in Scripture that, that I'm just not going to get and that I'm going to have to, to wrestle with, and um, I'm okay with that. Um, I'm okay not knowing all of the answers. So if you're in a position where you're not okay with Pastor Mark being able to answer all those questions for you, you can fast forward to the end of the, uh, the worship service and join in the, the closing hymn. Amberly's going to be leading through that, so you can fast forward there now if you want to. Or if you want to stay and um, be part of this conversation with me, we can look at some of these things, even though it may not be totally satisfying for us. 
So here's the, the things that I, I want to bring to us um, this morning about this passage from Genesis chapter 22. You know, as the, the passage begins, it's the story of Abraham having a conversation with God, and it says that God, as a way of testing Abraham's devotion, um, uh, tells uh, Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. And as the story unfolds, Isaac uh, is taken up the mountain by his father Abraham. And at the last moment, as Abraham is about to plunge the knife into uh, Isaac's heart, uh, God stops him and provides a ram to be used instead of his son Isaac as a sacrifice. And as as I said, this passage um, is a difficult one for me. You know, Beyond the whole sacrificing your son, <laughs> bugaboo, <laughs> is in this uh, passage of scripture that makes it so difficult. You know, there's also this idea of the God who knows everyone's innermost hearts and everyone's innermost feelings and knows us better than we even know ourselves. The God who sits on a throne in power and majesty and spoke and creation leapt into, an exist- uh, leapt into existence Uh, is providing a a test to see someone's devotion to him rather than being able to just look into their hearts and see what they are about. For the the God whose whose history of uh, of everything before history to the present to everything in the future is laid out in front of him like a scroll for um, this story about having to test someone's devotion to understand whether or not they're truly devoted to God seems foreign to me. And then to be able to put it in the context of doing something as horrific as sacrificing your child seems to go against so much of what um, Scripture tells us about justice and about peace and about mercy and all of those things. So it's a difficult passage to wrestle with. You know, as we come to this story, um, we bring all this baggage with us and all these things that make this passage difficult for us to, to comprehend and quite frankly, difficult for some of us to even read. So even though this passage is difficult for us to read in light of all of Scripture, uh, you know, I think there's some important things for us to hear in this passage. Uh, if, and for the record, if someone were to come to me and say, you know, in um, my prayer time, I feel as though God is asking if I would sacrifice my child as a way of showing devotion and asking me to do that, uh, I would unequivocally say the answer to that question is no, you shouldn't do that. You know, I've had lots of conversations with people who sat in my office in various states of mental health, and, and some of them have said some pretty um, scary and emotional things about harming themselves or harming others. And I have always said, regardless of your mental state, if, if in your relationship with God it leads you to a place where God is telling you that you should either harm yourself or that you should harm others as an act of punishment, um, then uh, I believe you've heard God wrong and you've read those passages of Scripture wrong. If the God who spoke and creation leapt into existence, if the God of compassion and mercy, if the Prince of Peace is telling you that you need to harm someone or kill someone to prove your devotion or to prove God's power, then I think you've read that passage wrong and that you need to re-examine what your faith is really all about. This passage is a little bit different. This passage is not a passage that says Isaac was to be Uh, sacrificed because of a a punishment or something that he did that was wrong. This is a a, a test that it says that was given as a way of proving um, Abraham's devotion. And so it's a little bit different from those standpoints, but it's still, boy, a a horrific and heartbreaking story. You know, as I I look at this story too, I I see this, this picture of Abraham walking with his son Isaac up that mountain and Isaac thinking that this is going to be just like all the other times that they have gone out to uh, perform sacrifices to the Lord. And yet it becomes very different um, as they continue to walk through this story together. Um, You know, I have a friend who uh, is very much into um, geography in the Bible. He's written a, a couple of books about it. And I have to admit, I'd never really thought too much about geography in the Bible, but he, um, when I read his Bible studies and read his books and have conversations with him, he has fascinating things that bring to light 
uh, things in scripture that I never thought about in terms of the way the land is formed and how people would react to the land and what they had to do because of, of the geography, which adds a whole other layer of, uh, to my understanding of scripture. And, and he, he has a, a Bible study where he goes through these uh, specific places in, in scripture where things happen and how, how at these collection of places a number of important things happen. You know, it's because of time and distance um, and the way that we've recorded history. You know, it's, it's pretty hard to, to pinpoint exactly where something happened in a story that, you know, predates uh, almost prehistory, right? And so for a lot of times, we have to use just kind of the, the tradition uh, that a, a community has about these, uh, these places. But, you know, it's interesting uh, to, to read about, like, like, say, places like Mount Sinai where the, the Ten uh, Commandments were uh, delivered. And, and right around that same area where Mount Sinai is, a number of very important things happened in our scriptures. And they all seem to be centered around kind of that, that geographic location, the, the place where the Israelites crossed over the Jordan River and into the land that God had promised there's a number of things important in the gospel around the baptism of Jesus and other things in the Jordan River that all kind of revolve around that same place. Uh, around Jerusalem and the hills around Jerusalem, there's a, a number of really significant stories that take place uh, around those geographic locations. And, and this story this morning from Genesis chapter 22, the, the, the mountain, or at least for those of us from the Pacific Northwest who have mountains like Mount Hood and Mount Rainier, we would maybe call it a hill. But, but the hill that Abraham and Isaac climb up to, that, that the story unfolds on, is just a stone's throw away from the hill that Jesus climbed to be executed on. You know, there's no denying some similarities in these two stories. I mean, not only do they take place just a stone's throw from one another, but, but the similarity of, of Isaac walking up that hill, carrying the, the, the um, wood on his shoulders that are ultimately going to be used for his own sacrifice is eerily reminiscent of Jesus walking up a hill, carrying the wood of the cross on his shoulder that he'll be sacrificed on, Right? In this story in Genesis chapter 22, when, when Isaac uh, asks his father, Lord, we, or Dad, we have the, the, the wood for the, uh, for the offering, but where's the ram? And Abraham says, uh, the Lord will provide. And as we read the rest of the story, we know that a ram does appear and, and the Lord does provide a, a suitable substitute for that sacrifice. And in the story of Jesus, as he carries that cross up the hill, Jesus is the substitute, right? I mean, Jesus is the one who is, Jesus is the Lamb of God who is provided as a substitute for that sacrifice. And so there's all kinds of similarities around this. You know, as I read the story in Genesis, I, I hear the story in terms of, of all these things happening, maybe as a way of foreshadowing something that was going to happen as a way of, of giving us an idea that centuries later this story would, would unfold, but in a, a different way in which, uh, again, someone who is dearly loved is sacrificed. You know, I wonder if this passage of Scripture is one that we're supposed to read and be horrified by. I mean, I wonder if, if as we read this passage and we see the parallels between this story of Isaac being taken up and going to be sacrificed and the, the story of Jesus being sacrificed on, on a cross for our sins, I wonder if as we read that Genesis chapter 22 passage, if we're supposed to be horrified, if we're supposed to, to feel this, this heartbreak and say, how could this happen? How could, how could the Lord ask something like that of someone and to feel the horror of it as a way of understanding what the horror of the sin of humanity has brought us to in Jesus' sacrifice. I wonder if maybe we're supposed to be deeply upset by this story. I wonder if we're not supposed to just accept it at face value, but, but that we're supposed to be horrified at, at it at the same way that we understand how sin, the horrifying things that sin has brought upon us, and the difficulty of remedying that sin and what that costs. I wonder if we're supposed to read this story and understand that feeling. I wonder if we're supposed to be horrified by this story. You know, another way that I look at this story um, is 
Uh, and I have to admit that I, I wrestle with this uh, to try to kind of get out of the, the full Nelson that, that Scripture uh, has put me in, and I've got to do a lot of moves to get here. But one of the ways that I have been able to look at this story is to kind of take the humanity and the emotion out of it. Um, and I don't know that I can always do that, and um, that's a big if, right? And I know that for some of you, you're not able to do that as well. But rather than read this story in terms of a son and a father and the the horrible story that um, is taking place there, sometimes if I look at this passage and try to think about what does Isaac represent, you know, I've often told you you can't take a story out of the context of Scripture and just kind of pull it out on its own. And I think it's important for us to look at this story in terms of the things that are happening uh, around Genesis chapter 20, 22. You know, a few chapters before this, God talks to Abraham and God tells Abraham that he uh, has this great promise that he is going to make. And he makes a promise to Abraham that says, your descendants will grow to be a great nation. And if you ever wanted to count them, it would be like counting the stars in the sky or trying to count the sand on the seashore. He says, your, your, king, your uh, descendants are going to grow to be a great kingdom. And not only are they going to grow to be a great kingdom, but they're going to be a blessing for all of the world. And God makes this promise to Abraham. And Abraham has this jackpot, cha-ching kind of moment and says, I am 100% in. I mean, this is, this is the best news Abraham has ever heard because all the things around power and wealth and influence and all those things that are important in his culture, having a large and prosperous family is the way that you get to those things. And for God to guarantee that not only will you have a, 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 prosper, or a large family and prosper, but that you grow to be a great nation and that your descendants would outnumber the stars of the sky, that is the best news Abraham could ever get. Not even to mention that, that uh, his descendants would end up being a blessing for all of creation. And so he gets this wonderful news, this wonderful promise from God. And uh, just a, a few chapters after getting that promise from God, God calls up Abraham again and says, So Abraham, I want you and your wife Sarah to move to this land that's way on the other side across the horizon. And Abraham says, Well, wait a minute. I thought we were doing this build a kingdom thing. Um, but you want me to pick up all my belongings? You want me to pick up all my stuff? You want me to move all the way over there? Well, that doesn't make sense, but okay, we'll, we'll do it. I'll follow you wherever you tell me to go, and then we'll start building the kingdom once we get over there, right? And so he moves and, and goes uh, over to the land of Ur. And then we get another uh, story of uh, God talking to Abraham and as this, or uh, another chapter at least in the story of God's promise to Abraham. And, and you know, one of the ways that you have a lot of descendants is that you need to have children. But Abraham and Sarah weren't having any children. And so Abraham was getting frustrated about if this promise is really going to take place, if I'm going to have lots of descendants, it's got to start with at least one, right? And because he and Sarah weren't having any children, he decided that he would have children with one of his handmaidens and ultimately had a son named Ishmael with one of his servants named Hagar. And then uh, after a a while, Sarah, it says, when they were near 100 years old, Sarah gives birth to her son Isaac. And in this story in Genesis chapter 16, Scripture tells us very plainly that the the promise of God is going to come from Isaac, not from his son Ishmael. And not very surprisingly, Sarah and uh, Sarah, uh, Abraham's wife, and Hagar, the servant with whom uh, uh, Abraham has a child, don't get along very well. And in that fight, ultimately, Sarah wins. And in chapter 16, uh, Abraham ends up uh, pushing uh, Ishmael and Hagar out of the camp, not knowing if they would survive. And there's this story of a heartbroken father who sends his son out to the wilderness, not knowing if he's going to survive. And so he's already lost one son. And his plan for making this all come about seems to not be working out so well. But at least there's Isaac, right? At least he's got Isaac. Isaac is still the key to this whole thing. Isaac is still the key to their prosperity. Isaac is the future. And he gets another call from God. And God says, I'm going to take Isaac away too. I'm going to take the future away. Isaac is the key to this promise, not just for Abraham, but for all the world. 
And in this story, as, as uh, Isaac walks up this mountain and as Abraham goes up there to sacrifice him, there's this sense that all the plans that Abraham has been trying to put together to, to make sure that this promise happens the way that he wants it to happen, all those things get taken off the table when God says, I'm taking Isaac away. I mean, all those things get taken off the table as a way of reminding Abraham that he's not the one in charge. That it's not his plan that God is working with, but that, in fact, God is the one who holds this promise. In fact, God is the one who holds all the pieces of this life together. And when he says, I'm taking Isaac away, I'm taking that, that chapter out of the story, Abraham has to come to that stark realization of understanding that this is God who is in charge and not me. And the plans that Abraham have had haven't been working out so well. In fact, the, the fighting that we see between Sarah and Hagar and the, the way that, that Abraham is trying to manipulate God and get the things that he wants to get this promise is something that gets passed down to Isaac and to his uh, grandchildren and his great-grandchildren. And his family always has this issue around cheating one another to get what they want, to do what they want to do rather than understanding what God has called them to do and be. And so in this story, we get a, a glimpse of, of what it is to give up our plans and to let God be the one who is in control of things. Boy, that's a tough message to hear right now because I know a lot of us have plans that have been dashed on the rocks in the last two months. I mean, I, I, I don't even make plans for more than two weeks at a time because I know everything's going to change, Right? And I know for a lot of us, that puts us in this unsettling place. And it's difficult for us to remember that even when we put together the best laid plans, and even when we do so with the best of intentions, it's important for us to remember that God is the one who is ultimately in control. The God who has been with us before history began and the God who will be with us long after you and I are gone is the God who holds us in the palm of his hand, the one who loves us and the one who ultimately is in control of all these things. Now, do I wish this story came to us in a different way? Do I wish that that truth could be revealed to us in a different way? Yes, I wish it was. I wish it came in a, in a different form. I wish it didn't have all the baggage that, that comes with it. I wish that it wasn't so hard for us to hear. But I also hope that in this time we're able to understand that there's still a God who is in control. And I hope that we're able to understand that the God who loves us is the one who has been with us before time began and the one who will be with us into the future. And even if you're not in a place to be able to hear the truth of this scripture, I hope that we are all in a place where we're able to trust this God who has been with us all along and will be with us tomorrow. Amen. Amen. Romans 6, 23 tells us, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm so thankful for the salvation that we have. Let's praise his great name together.
So friends, let me give you this benediction as we finish our time together. Go from here celebrating that we serve a God who loves us. Go from here rejoicing that the same God who was with us yesterday, today, and tomorrow is the same God who leads us through the times of trouble. Go from here in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen.